this is a big deal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead chose to send us a prophet who looked and acted like the average human being, right? And that's why people were struggling with this notion. There, there was a lot of tension as to how the Prophet of Allah would just be another human being who goes out in the marketplace, who works. Do you know what the Prophet's hobby was, by the way? Not hobby, I mean, you know, for lack of a better word. The thing he did quite often at home when he wasn't dealing with official business, if you like, or spreading the message of Allah. Do you know what he did? He would sew his own clothes. He would fix his own shoes. That's what he did. I mean, what's more human than that? That you have clothes that have been torn or worn, and so you sit down with your family and you sew them, you fix them. So it's, it's a big deal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to send someone that we can relate to, someone that we could see, someone that we could communicate with, someone that we don't feel is superior to us. He's not superior to us. He's another human being who was able to achieve the status. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Rasulan min anfusikum. He's one of you, right? And what's amazing is that even though he's one of us, even though he's a human being, and yet, subhanallah, he could have at least acted like he was superior to us. At the end of the day, we all have a tendency to see ourselves as being higher than others if there is something we have that they lack, right? If I had a PhD, I'd make sure I'd flaunt it everywhere I go, right? If I was taller or stronger or more muscular than everybody else, I'd make sure, you know, instead of wearing this, I'd wear something so as to give some hints as to my physical abilities. We all have a tendency to try and make ourselves noticed given all the things that we have while others lack those things. Whereas look at the Messenger of Allah. Let me share a few hadith with you. This one you're probably familiar with. People would come into the mosque and they would see the Messenger of Allah sit, well, they'd see a bunch of Muslims seated around one another and, they, and they'd be speaking. But the Prophet was such that they couldn't tell him apart. They couldn't make him out. Who is the Prophet? Who's the Messenger? They had no idea. Which is why in one hadith, Abu Dhar says that this became a problem. We would have Bedouins, we would have people who came from outside Mecca, we would have, you know, maybe uh, delegates of other religions, of foreign governments, we'd have Christian monks, and we'd have people who don't recognize the Prophet. They would come into the mosque and they couldn't recognize him, so they'd have to ask around and it became a problem. So we came up to the Prophet and we said to him, Ya Rasulullah, we need to do something about this, right? If it's the turban, nowadays turbans are exclu exclusive to people who, you know, preach the faith or, or study this religion. Back in the day, everybody wore turbans, right? In different colors. And so Abu Dhar says, we told the messenger that this is a problem. We need to make you distinct so that people know who to ask. So that they don't just walk up to any random Tom, Dick and Harry and ask them about the religion. And so he's, he then says, Abu Dhar says, that we built a little bench, right? Dukkan or Dekke. He says, فَبَنَيْنَا دُكَّانًا أَوْ دَكَّانًا A little bench from mud. Not even a chair, a bench. And the Prophet would sit on that bench and we would sit alongside of him. And he would deliver his sermons. Isn't that amazing? The Holy Messenger of Allah was a human being. And yet, did he have emotions? Absolutely. As I said, people found that difficult to, to grapple with. How could the Messenger of God, who speaks to celestial beings, whose friend is the Archangel Gabriel, how could someone like that be a human being like me? So they expected the Prophet to act in a different manner. Which is why when his son Ibrahim passed away and died at the young age of a year and a half, the Prophet was seen crying. So one of the companions comes up to the Prophet and he says to him, 
Why are you crying? And why are you crying so profusely? And here's another point I'd like you to remember. The Prophet of Allah was perfect in every way. And so his emotions were also perfect. Which means that when there was room for an emotional outpour, there would be an emotional outpour. That is basically tantamount or, or, or something that you would attribute to someone as perfect as the Prophet of Allah. So he cried. And this is the Prophet who's not just crying over his dead son, he's crying over someone like Ibrahim, someone who would have been, who would have been someone uh, who is, if not an Imam, then someone on equal footing as an Imam, someone who's infallible. So he says to him, why would you cry so much? And the Prophet responds by saying that the eyes tear up, the tears flow out of the eyes and the heart breaks, but we'd never say anything that would displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's only natural, it's only human. Once again, he's worn the garb of humanity, even though essentially he's different. He is superior, but at least outwardly the Prophet acts like every other human being. In fact, he acted like the lowest caste in society. Now, I want you to think long and hard about this because this has never been done in human history. You don't have, and I challenge anyone to prove me wrong, you don't have any head of state, any premier, any president, any king, any emperor who at the time of his kingdom and at the peak of his power would act in the same fashion as Rasulullah. How does he act? The hadith says, he would sit like any slave. I mean, think about slaves and their position in society at those times. A slave wasn't just the scum of the earth. A slave wasn't just someone treated like worse than dirt or animals. A slave was the lowest caste. That's, that's all we can say, really. And the Prophet acted like a slave. How do you act like a slave? You sit, tajlisu ala al There was a woman, the Prophet was sitting down, eating with a bunch of other slaves on dirt, on the sand. So this woman walks past him. Qalat, Ya Rasulullah, atajlisu ala al wa ta'kulu akla al-abid. You're sitting on dirt and you're eating the food of slaves. Do you know why? One hadith says, كَانَ يَقْبَلُ دَعْوَةَ الْمَمْلُوكِ If a slave came up to him and invited him to come and eat, he would accept the invitation. Now a slave has nothing of, of himself. A slave is owned by someone else. How much food, how extravagant do you think the banquet would be where the Prophet is being served food? Right? And yet he would accept any invitation especially if it came from slaves. So the woman says to the Prophet, you're sitting on dirt and you're eating slave food. فَنَظَرَ إِلَيْهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَقَالَ وَيْحَكِ Woe unto you. وَهَلْ أَحَدٌ أَعْبَدَ مِنِّي Is there anyone more of a slave than I am? So the woman then said to him, أَعْطَنِي لُقْمَةً مِنْ طَعَامِكِ Give me a bite of that food that you're eating. She immediately was filled with awe of the Messenger of Allah. And so it's a weird transition really to be saying, why are you sitting like a slave? And then saying, give me some of that food. Cause she just attacked that food and saying that is slave food, right? But she was immediately filled with awe to the Messenger of Allah. So she says, give me one, one bite. So the Prophet grabbed a bite and handed it to her. She said, لا والله إلا التي في فمك. No, I want the one in your mouth. فَأَخْرَجَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ اللُّقْمَةَ الَّتِي فِي فَمِهِ He took that bite from his mouth, his blessed mouth, and he handed it over to the woman. Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam says, فَمَا أُصِيبَتْ تِلْكَ الْمَرْأَةُ بِدَاءٍ حَتَّى مَاتَتْ That woman never felt any pain or disease in her body until the day she died. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.